The Huntsman Winter's War is the prequel that's really a sequel to an average but still enjoyable movie. But we all know the reason a sequel was greenlit. Money. I can only assume that the creative minds behind this project were so enthralled with the dollar signs in their eyes that they didn't see how their movie was a total ripoff on Disney's Frozen Money Train. Not that I blame them, Frozen merchandise is still selling like hotcakes. Let's be honest, ice and snow are in right now from the aforementioned monolithic Frozen to the equally monolithic Winter is Coming Game of Thrones. It's cool to be cold. Yep, that was, a, that was a bad pun. Regardless of how icily you feel about my winter jokes, the fact remains that from the very beginning, the signs didn't look good for Winter's War. Most people, including myself, felt that this was an entirely unnecessary sequel, and the opening of the movie validates every uneasy feeling I had about watching it. The movie starts with narration, and narration will either be a hit or a miss. And even though Liam Neeson does a fabulous job, as he always does, his wonderful voice does nothing to replace the already glazed look in your eyes, as you realize that this movie is going to be basically every fantasy cliche ever created. Just to know, I'm going into full spoiler territory here, so if you really don't want this movie spoiled for you before you watch it, you need to make sure to have forgotten everything you have ever watched or read, particularly children's stories and fairy tales. So with that disclaimer out of the way, let's go plow some snow! You see, Aslan slash Taken Guy informs us that the first few things we will be seeing took place before the events in the previous movie. We then see the queen from the original movie, Charlize Theron, kill some old king guy by beating him at chess. Who knew chess could be so deadly? The queen then has a brooding talk with her sister, Freya, and tells her she needs to embrace the power in her blood instead of sleeping with a merry guy. The queen does this because she's a good sister, right? No, she is obviously jealous that Freya is happy and only wants Freya to find her powers so that she can use them to further her own agendas, like world domination. So original. Freya tells her sister that she is pregnant and that she wants to run away with the nobleman guy so they can live as one big happy family. This time the queen warns Freya that she is setting herself up for her heart to be frozen, uh, broken. This comes true when the nobleman guy apparently kills their infant daughter in the crib and of course the queen had no part to play in this, right? Sure she didn't, because what kind of person would manipulate a father to kill his own infant child? Probably some sort of creature made of icky black goo is what? Wait, doesn't the queen turn into an icky black goo monster? It's probably just coincidence. Uh, Freya then suddenly uh, frost blasts Nobleman Guy because as opposed to singing the most overrated song of all time about exercising less grip strength, all Freya needed to do to find her powers was only to have the most precious thing in the world to her killed. Then, in a move that shocks no one who has studied Norse mythology or seen any of the Thor movies, Freya decides to move to the north and become the Ice Queen. She then abducts children so that they won't be hurt by the future pain of losing someone they loved. Which makes perfect sense because children obviously wouldn't feel any emotional pain by being abducted by complete strangers who just killed their families. Duh. Freya then trains these children to be cold-hearted killers, her huntsmen. Her plan works so well that two of her huntsmen, Eric, Thor, and Sarah, Zero Dark Thirty Lady, fall in love in like two minutes. The two lovers plan to escape, but in the shocker of all shockers, Freya already knows. What? Eric and Sarah show us how much butt they can kick before Freya decides that the Hunger Games are over and she uses her powers to make an ice wall separating the lovers. As the lovers look at each other through the ice wall, Eric sees that Sarah is killed because a main character featured in a fantasy movie that dies only 10 to 15 minutes into the movie totally stays dead, right? It could have been an illusion by magic ice, could it? No, that would be too obvious. Eric then gets beat up so much that they think he's dead and then they toss him down a river, but somehow he survives because Eric flexes his Thor muscles and uses his super buoyancy to float to safety while blacked out. What about hypothermia, you ask? Norse gods don't have time for that. They were literally born from ice giants. What is a brief swim in a winter mountain river? 
years passed and the prequel now becomes a sequel. Eric is living his humble huntsman life when the prince from the first movie, now the king, asks Eric to track down the mirror. Apparently Snow White thought that she was going crazy from the dark magic in the mirror, so she had it sent away to be locked up, as opposed to throwing it into Mount Doom where it was forged. The ring, I mean, the mirror, was being transported by soldiers, but those soldiers somehow went missing, and the Prince King wants Eric to find the mirror to take it to Sanctuary, which is, get this, a safe place to prevent the mirror from working its dark magic. Never would have gotten that from the name. Eric agrees to find the evil mirror because that's what Marvel comic book heroes do. He is accompanied by the best thing in this movie, which are two hilarious dwarves who are there to be totally awesome, but kicking allies. They are totally not bumbling buffoon psychics. The trio then travels to places and the dwarves say some legitimately funny stuff and then there's a fight with some other huntsmen and uh, once Eric's about to be killed, uh, totally dead but not really dead, Sarah saves the day. A surprise, right? I mean, whoa, who saw that coming? We then find out that it really was magic ice because when Sarah looked at Eric, she saw Eric walking away from her. Sarah now hates Eric, so they there goes the romance for the film because rotting years in a cell for a forbidden love would obviously make you never fall in love with that person again. Darn it! I was hoping for a love story in this movie. It's obviously not going to happen to the wisecracking dwarves who keep going on about how terrible dwarf women are. Oh yeah, how did Sarah escape Freya's prison after seven years? Eh, probably not important. She's talented enough to pull something like that off. Anyways, a servant decides to join the trio to find the mirror. The foursome gets caught in a trap set by dwarf women, and of course, personal insults between the dwarf men and women ensue. The women then decide to help because riches. The company finds out that the mirror was stolen by goblins, which really look more like jewelry wearing orc monkey things than a typical goblin, but you know, whatever. And they, they fight and win against these goblin things, duh. Uh, but Eric appears to die, and then Sarah cries, even though she totally still hates Eric. So, you know, good acting there. Yeah. But Eric somehow actually survives. Although, how just did he get across that river of acid? Ah, who cares? Everything is hunky-dory now, and Sarah doesn't seem to hate Eric so much. I think, I mean, she does kiss him after all. But it turns out Sarah really isn't all that talented because she was set free by Freya to find the mirror and betray Eric and the dwarves. Two of the dwarves are then turned into ice statues. Wait, does this story take place in Narnia? Regardless, Sarah proves her loyalty to Freya by shooting Eric in the chest with an arrow. But the hero of a fantasy story can't die, right? You're correct! Sarah placed her shot on the world's toughest locket as opposed to Eric's heart. This proves that Sarah really does love Eric because love stories in fantasy movies always have the weirdest logic. I mean, who kisses a dead girl or climbs up a person's hair to reach the top of a tower? Fantasy characters! That's who! So then Eric takes the two unfrozen dwarves, who obviously still hate each other's guts, and they totally won't fall in love by the end of the movie, and all three of them infiltrate the fortress, with Eric basically skydiving onto a roof and prevents himself from going splat by literally holding on by his fingertips. Eric gets a clear shot at Freya, but she is saved suddenly by her sister Ravenna, who had buried her spirit into the mirror which totally doesn't sound at all like a story I heard about a ring once. Eric is captured, but gives a stirring speech that rallies a lot of huntsmen to his side. Ravenna then starts wiping the floor with the huntsmen, but this upsets Freya, who seems to have taken a really bad job of following her own advice, as she seems to be very emotionally invested in these huntsmen that are dying. Although, that might also be part of the fact that she finds out that the black goo monster that's her sister really did kill her child because Ravenna has severe jealousy issues, I guess. Freya is then mortally wounded in her fight with her sister and it is left to Eric to save the day. But Eric obviously has problems with killing Ravenna as Eric forgot to pack his hammer Mjolnir, nor does he call on the rest of the Avengers. I'm sure a call to the big green guy really could have helped a lot. 
But why do you need a Hulk when you can just freeze a mirror and smash it with an axe? That seems to work pretty well. Ravenna then turns into a pile of black crumbly things and Freya dies happy and everyone who hated each other now loves each other and stuff! And then the credits roll with the credit song that's actually a song with words and not just instrumental stuff like, you know, all the Narnia and Lord of the Rings movies and other fantasy movies with ice people and dwarves and hate, love, relationships. And then, of course, you know, well, the end happens and that's, well, you know, the end. So I hope you enjoyed my humorous review of The Huntsman, Winter's War. My brief and perfectly honest synopsis of this movie is that it is a uninspired, cliche-filled fantasy movie full of tropes. But if that's all you want from a movie, it certainly scratches that itch as it did for me. The acting was solid and the visuals were stunning, but it still doesn't make up for a completely uninvented script and completely foreseeable plot. This is a great one-time viewing fantasy guilty pleasure movie, but unfortunately that is all this well-polished fantasy guilty pleasure will ever be. Anyways, go ahead and let me know what any one viewing guilty pleasure fantasy movies you know of in the comments section below. Please be sure to like and subscribe, and I want to thank you for watching. This is The Outcast Writer, signing off, and remember, what we create matters.